The introductory bars of Toccata Nona from Il Primo Libro di Toccata, the first book of Toccatas by Frescobaldi, all of which, on his recommendation, could be concluded at any given cadence. There's no doubt that Girolamo Frescobaldi was a genius, a trendsetter extraordinario. He was born towards the very end of the Renaissance period, an age of exploration and discovery on many fronts. Frescobaldi's style evolved from several influences, most notably the Netherlands. A number of composers from this area took up residence in other countries, particularly Italy, where their style transformed musical thinking. Choral polyphony had reached its peak in beauty and expressiveness during the second half of the 16th century, especially in the music of Palestrina in Italy, Lassus in the Netherlands, Bird in England, and Victoria in Spain. Through his teacher, Luzasco Luzarski, Frescobaldi learned his craft in all the traditional forms, including the elaborately ornamented solo madrigal style of which Luzarski was a master. Patronised by Cardinal Guido Bentivoglio, who'd taken up a papal position in 1599, Frescobaldi was appointed organist at the Church of Santa Maria in Trastivari in 1607, before travelling with his patron to Brussels, an important centre for keyboard music in the North European tradition. Frescobaldi's first set of madrigals was published in Antwerp in 1608 and was dedicated to Cardinal Bentivoglio. Before returning to Rome, both men visited Milan, where Frescobaldi's fantasies were published in the same year. Although not especially mature works, they show the genius of a young mind, and were probably intended to impress the Vatican authorities, as an appointment at St Peter's was on the horizon. In July 1608, at the age of 25, he was offered the post as organist there at San Pietro in Vaticana. Such was his fame that a contemporary report recorded an audience of 30,000 people who came to hear him play. His first book of Toccatas, published in 1615, was to revolutionise the medium, and this is where his greatness first became apparent. The historical evolution of the Toccata arose not from any contrapuntal form, but from the improvisatory province of the performer. The Venetian Toccatas of Andrea Gabrielli, published in 1593, and Claudio Merulu's two collections of Toccatas of 1598 and 1604, had till then set a definite precedent. These collections, together with Toccatas by Giovanni Trabacchi and Asconio Maioni, presented some extremely original ideas, acting not only as a model, but also as a departure point for Frescobaldi, who elevated the genre to a greater level of sophistication. Chromaticism, highly imaginative harmonic progressions, frequently oscillating major and minor thirds, and rhythmic innovations are just some of the inspirational elements that set his music apart, representing a milestone not only in his career, but also in the history of keyboard music. Because at this time modes governed composition, instruments were tuned in mean tone temperament, a system incorporating a certain number of pure thirds and narrowly tuned fifths, which afforded each mode a particular character. This temperament suited Frescobaldi's chromaticism to a certain degree, but it still had limitations. As modes were given greater freedom, more instruments were produced with split keys, similar to this, where the front of the key plays the more common notes and the back of the key the less frequently used. So, for example, in mean tone temperament, fifths were tuned fairly narrow, beating quite noticeably with the tonic, and thirds were tuned pure, or beatless. This is a pure third from E to G sharp. Notice the wonderful dryness of the major third. If I now add the narrowly tuned fifth, it generates warmth to the triad. On a normal keyboard, of course, G sharp is the end harmonic of A flat, and in mean tone temperament would produce an unacceptable major third to the C above. 
if I now play the back of the key, the A flat, which has been tuned a perfect third below C, preserves the pure sounding major triad. Here's a passage from Frescobaldi's Cento Partita Sopra Passacali, which modulates quite astonishingly and illustrates the necessity for split keys. If I play first as if on a standard keyboard, you'll hear how sour this passage sounds and would probably send you screaming back to the CD shop for a refund. Now the same passage with split accidentals. This piece ends in the key of E major. The penultimate chord, a suspension on the dominant B, resolves on D sharp, so has to be played at the back of the key as the front has formerly served as an E flat, its chromatic counterpart. If I play the dominant chord with the E flat, you can hear how offensive it would sound and would ruin the tonality at the end of the piece. Here's the chord with the D sharp played at the back just to restore your oral balance. Instruments with these mod cons were quite common in Italy up until around 1640. This instrument on average has 15 notes to the octave and was made around 1619 by Giovanni Battista Boni, providing a fascinating link with the composer and his music. During his lifetime, Frescobaldi had many patrons, mainly cardinals in the hierarchy of the church. His last patron, Cardinal Francesco Barberini, was nephew to Pope Urbano VIII, Secretary of State and a connoisseur of the arts and music. He was in a unique position to patronise the great musician who performed regularly at his palace. Il Cardinale Barberino, as he was known, owned many instruments housed in the Palazzo della Cancellaria, his residence as Vice-Chancellor and Cardinal of the Church in San Lorenzo in Dampso. <laughs> 